everybody for coming today to our Leadership Talks event um, with the Rowan University Women's Alliance Network. I'm Chrissy Beswick. Good to see everybody. Um, I'm the chairperson of this amazing board of women throughout Rowan University um, who help to put on these events, which are designed to provide professional development opportunity for everyone, um, inclusive of gender, inclusive of identity. We are open and welcome to all, and we are so glad that you could be here with us today. Um, before I introduce um, our speakers to you, I do just want to give a quick thank you to TD Bank. Um, TD Bank is our sponsor. Um, they provide us a generous grant every year to help us provide this um, opportunity for the Rowan University community and even beyond. So we're very grateful for their continued support, not only of the WAN, but also of Rowan University. Um, so I want to just give a really brief intro for our speakers today. Um, as I mentioned, we have an amazing panel today. And um, these people are going to talk to you today about what leadership means to them, how they have found it, and how their identities negotiate within that leadership position. So I think this is all really important for us each to con consider individually as people and also as professionals. And I'm very grateful for their time. Um, these are very high powered, very busy people. So we're very grateful that they could be so generous to share their time with us today. Um, so you all should have received um, a link with our speakers um, and their bios. So I'm not going to read the whole bio to you. Um, but I did just want to give you a quick overview of who will be speaking today. So first we have Tabitha Dobbins. Um, she's our associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. She's also the provost um, fellow for research and the Division of University Re Research. We're so happy that she is able to join us here today. Um, we also have Roy McAlee, who's the vice president for student affairs and also professor of psychology. We have Penny McPherson Myers, who's the vice president, president for our division of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have Roxy Patton, who is the director of the Office of Social Justice, Inclusion, and Conflict Resolution. We have Annette Raboli, who is the dean of the Cooper Medical School. Uh, so we're go so glad that Annette can be here with us today. We have Melissa Weecroft, who's our general counsel for the university. So as you can see, quite a dynamic panel from all throughout Rowan University. I'm really excited to hear what they have to share with us today. And with that, Tabitha, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Chrissy, uh, to the Women's Alliance Network for extending this kind invitation to me to share what I hope will be some um, helpful, helpful tools for you guys um, as you consider um, as you consider your career pathway. And I think that the general theme of my um, talk is sort of about learning and in particular about lifelong learning. We went through our schooling already and some of us have already gone through the highest degrees we can go to. So what do you do then? What is lifelong learning about and what does it mean to you? So, um, so I titled this learning using the language of light. And I just wanna make sure to not be specific about um, uh, what you learn. I'm gonna use my example because I had to learn a very difficult, a very challenging topic area later in, in life. And so um, physics, a, a very challenging topic area in physics. So that was quote unquote, the language of light. But I think I'm gonna have some general remarks that applies to any learning. And so with that, I just wanted to recap my journey and my um, education experiences. So I, I talk about my elementary school in North Philadelphia, my middle school in North Philadelphia, which was not one of the wealthiest, it's probably one of the poorest neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Then my high school in Philadelphia, one of the best high schools in the city, Philadelphia High School for Girls. I went on to Lincoln University where that I started to pursue my career in physics and then um, my master's at the University of Penn, my PhD at Penn State University, 
And then after my PhD, I did a postdoc, which is a two year focus study on a particular topic. And you'll see later in the slides, the topic that I um, started to endeavor in at that stage was learning about studying materials with light, with x-rays, which we also consider a form of light. And so then I moved on to my faculty position in Louisiana. I was joint faculty at two schools, Grambling State University and Louisiana Tech University, where I was housed in a state-of-the-art institute for micromanufacturing. That's the bottom picture out of the two pictures. And so I was able to really engage with students and engage with my research and, and that way. And then on to Rowan University, where of course you know Science Hall is a state-of-the-art building. We want more, and we we have more of those um, state-of-the-art science buildings coming up uh, with School of the Earth and Environment. And as of July 1, I became the interim vice president for research and dean of the graduate school. So this is a little bit of my pathways, but let's get into this idea about learning. At the stage of my postdoc, I began to use one of these facilities, and it's actually the one that you see the aerial view on on the leftmost of your screen. These are called synchrotron light sources or advanced light sources. Can you imagine an entire building? The circumference of that, uh, the one on your left, is 1.3 miles. So if you walked around it, you would walk around that loop 1.3 miles. The loop is not for you to walk around, though. It is to help generate the x-rays that we use to study materials with. And that loop of 1.3 miles is what carries in the tunnel, in a vacuum tunnel within that building, electrons that are accelerated at the speed of light, and those electrons are what then generate, are used to generate the x-rays that we then can study materials. So you guys know x-rays from going to the hospital, going to the doctor's office, and, and seeing x-rays that can go through soft material like your skin and tissue, but now we want to send those x-rays through really solid blocks of material, so we need much higher intensity. I had the ability to uh, use multiple of those facilities and there are eight, only eight along the entire um, uh, North, North America and South America. There are only eight facilities. I haven't used all eight, but I've used many of them. I've had the ability to join on to other projects that I'll talk about later in the talk, such as the African Light Source Project, that is to build a synchrotron in Africa. And so what I want to teach, talk to you guys about or teach you guys about is the five things that you can um, you can, five reasons you should learn and use a topic area. Why should you undertake lifelong learning and use it? The first reason is um, that um, the key reason is that to learn any new thing is to gain access to new keys in order to open new doors. And so for the example, I'll tell the story that I began in my postdoc days, and then I was able to go on to Louisiana where there is a synchrotron associated with the Louisiana State University. I was only about um, around three hours away from it, and I took students to use that facility. Again, there are only eight in all of the Americas, and I was able to find a job, and so my new key was I, I had a job in a place that was only three hours away. And I'm from Philly. I would have never looked at move all the way to Louisiana except for this facility and the research I had begun. And um and then I was able to use the a facility in Stoughton, Wisconsin to give very, very um, interesting and useful data. And the key metric I want you guys to look at, lots of information on the slides, but the circumference is about 1.3 miles on both of these. So there are smaller facilities associated with the universities. And then finally, um, the one that I told you about, that was the one that I started using in my postdoc. So new keys to open new doors is why to undertake lifelong learning. The second reason to undertake lifelong learning is that learning a new field is challenging, so you must make it fun. This is something that you learn how to do to make it fun. And for me, what I had to do in order to make this um, idea more fun is I had to have my own concrete examples. And I ultimately ended up studying energy related materials um, in, with these, with these uh, x-rays. And that was something that was meaningful. It was something that would help the environment, that would help uh, cut down on pollution and things like that. So the significant, exciting problem and then using it in concrete examples was what also helped. Also, um, 
The other thing about using these facilities is that you meet so many people when you go to the facilities. So you become a part of a community of researchers. Uh, some of them become your collaborators. Some of them become your mentors and you get to engage your students with all of that. So that's the second reason is that uh, you, you, in order to engage with the learning and using, you must make it fun because it is gonna be challenging. There are gonna be some times where you're like, why am I even trying to learn this new thing? I should just go back and do the old things. The third reason uh, to learn and use a new topic, and in my case, it's the language of light, is because you must use your new keys to open the same new doors for others. And in that example, I'll tell the story of several groups of students. I was able to take my students, this is my student from Grambling State University, and behind him is the, the office building to the advanced folks and that ring that you saw, and that, that facility is in Chicago, Illinois, so we flew from Chicago, from Louisiana to Chicago. The ring that you saw from the air is right behind this building. And so um, undergraduate student mentoring, so this is um, Whitney, uh, I took her to this facility. So multiple groups of students, we would travel to this facility at least twice a year, and after I got to row and I continued that sort of activity. So again, um, using your new keys to open the same doors for others. Up here, what you see is that I taught a course at LSU uh, for a semester uh, about the technology, about the x-rays. And again, this is a challenging topic to learn. So I really, really in that semester, prided myself on building a set of notes that would bring the content directly to the material, directly to the student, whether they were a graduate student or undergraduate student, bringing this, these ideas that they had not um, encountered before, bringing it to their level. And, and I think I got a high level of engagement out of the students and they were, they were excited about being a part of that course. So again, new keys opening the same doors for others. And in that, at that time, there was a really a huge gap. Uh, the content was written up here and being able to translate it to this level where they can understand it much easier was something that I really enjoyed doing. The fourth reason to learn and use new things, in my case, it's the language of light, is that sometimes those doors that you, the, those, those open doors eventually close and you were one of the last ones to gain the opportunity to go through them. So as you saw, I used uh, three facilities. This one's in Louisiana. I mentioned the one in Wisconsin and also the one at the Advanced Photon Source but um, in Chicago, but this one closed down um, not too long after we used it. So here's the article about its decommissioning and closing in 2014. It had a 30 year long run. And here on the other side is the journal article that my students and I were able to publish that was with data that we collected. So the article came out in 2009. So we collected that data somewhere between 2006 and 2009. So we were one of the some of the last groups of people to actually use this facility. And even though it's very sad that it's closed, um, sometimes when you're um, when you want to learn new things and use new things, you get the opportunity to go through doors that eventually very soon will close again. And the fifth and final reason is that you can expand your boundaries further than you would have ever considered at the outset. So when I started doing research with x-rays back as a um, postdoc and then choosing to, a faculty career, choosing to move to Louisiana because I wanted to continue working with x-rays, I would have never considered that I would be joining by 2015, 2014 or 2015, a project in order to position an x-ray source on the continent of Africa. And so this is this facility does not exist. In fact, Africa is the only habitable continent that does not have a return x-ray facility. And I've put up a YouTube video coming from my invitation a year ago to speak with the Women's Alliance Network. And I talked all about this project. So if you wanna know more about it, you can learn it from there. But um, what I wanted to express to you guys is that you get an opportunity to really, when you take on a new challenge and learn new things, you get an opportunity to go even further than you would have imagined at the outset. So I got there by joining the African Light Source Executive Committee. It was an ad hoc committee of people who um, got together and decided that we would start working. And the work we've been doing has been focused on bringing a light source to Africa by hosting and 
annual conferences. And in fact, we're, we're, we've moved our conference this year because of COVID to work virtual and we're able to, um, we had an engagement the first day of the workshop was this morning and we had an engagement of, I want to say, I, I think there were a hundred and some odd people on the call. Yeah, there were there were more than a hundred on the call, and then it dropped down by the end of it to about 75. And this is worldwide interested in positioning a light source. And no, I won't go more into the light source itself details, like you can find it in the YouTube video that I put up from the Women's Alliance Network invitation a year ago. But um, what I wanted you guys to consider is what are your reasons to learn and use the next opportunity that's coming up before you. I think I've stuck to my time and I thank you again for listening. Thank you so much. What, what an amazing presentation. I know we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers later, but I just wanted to say, I really appreciate your sense of joy and exploration around your career and your work. Um, I think that it's really crucial to have joy in your profession because we, send, we spend so much of our time right here at work and with our colleagues and in the things that we're doing that it's wonderful to hear you so excited and, and inspired by the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you for that. And hopefully that's an inspiration for everybody here today. Um, okay, great. So we're gonna just go ahead and, and keep moving along with our next panelist. So next we have Roy McAuley. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Can someone please, oh, there's the share button. All right, uh, let me share my slides. Do you see those? The, yeah, you're all good, thanks, Rory. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, it's truly an honor to be part of this uh, particular group of women in this event today. Uh, to me, leadership is about the opportunity to serve alongside and support your team is the primary part of leadership. And I have two teams. Uh, I have my family and I have my Rowan team. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, how there are, uh, in any life, there are intentional and unintentional turning points. I'm going to be talking about both of these teams today and how they came to be. And I'm particularly talking about a lot of family issues because that's probably the most common thing that women ask me about when they think about their own professional journeys. I wanna start by prefacing our remarks today by talking about the theory of planned happenstance. And thank you so much to my colleagues in the Office of Career Advancement who introduced me to these, this theory. And as soon as I heard about it, I knew that this is actually how my life had unfolded. So planned and happenstance may seem contradictory to each other, but they actually go hand in hand. The point of the theory is that you take the first step by intentionally putting yourself into a situation and then chance can take over. So maybe it's someone that you meet at an event or an opportunity that comes to you because you took that initial step. And you can't really predict where it's going to go, but it all started because you took that first step. So you can purposefully create serendipity. Uh, and you can do things like that by saying yes to a project or by going to a Women's Alliance Network event, for example. So here are four institutions that are near and dear to my heart. I spent many years at each and they're not just part of my history, they're part of my identity. I was an undergraduate at Drew University and I knew even as a freshman that I wanted to be a college professor. And one reason why I wanted to be a college professor is because I wanted summers off with my kids. It doesn't quite work quite as well as that, uh, but I knew from the very beginning that having a family and a professional career as a professor were both really important to me. Immediately after college, I entered a PhD program at Cornell in social and personality psychology. And I got married after my second year there. Shortly after that, my career certainly was, the pathway was, was well underway to my career as a faculty member. Uh, and in thinking about kids, I saw one of my professors and mentors in the department mailroom one day. Sandra Bem was an internationally known, very impactful social psychologist and gender theorist. And she also had two children. So I asked her one time, I said, Sandy, what would be the best time for a woman in academia to have a baby? During graduate school, pre-tenure, post-tenure, because the thought is I don't wanna damage my career. Sandy looked at me and she said, 
don't let your career drive an important decision like that. Have a baby when you want to have a baby. So I had a baby and she's 27 now. Fast forward seven years and I was close to getting tenure at Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg, Virginia, a school that I absolutely loved and where I thought I would spend the rest of my career. Uh, when it comes to planned happenstance, uh, it was very interesting that I had a very unanticipated uh, turning point because of a chance event. I was at my daughter's Valentine's Day party in her kindergarten classroom and a friend of mine had just had another baby who was there. And I was admiring her baby and she said, do you think you'd wanna have another baby? Well, I already had two kids by then. And I said, oh no, because if I had another baby, I'd wanna stay home and I'm about to get tenure and I love my job. So, you know, that's off the table. And she just made an offhand comment. She said, yeah, it'd be really hard to give that up. Well, she didn't know it, but she actually had just in my mind taken something that I took as a fact of life, a given that was unchangeable, and instead turned it into a choice. And so with that offhand comment, it became a major turning point in my life. And that plus some other events at that same time led me actually to decide to become a stay-at-home mom and have that third baby who was born a year later. In fact, at the uh, meeting with the college president and dean where they told me that I got tenure, I told them that I was leaving. And I was a stay-at-home mom for the next two and a half years. So the, the, and that was very much planned, but it was because of a happenstance moment. And so it's a circular effect, how, how we go through the, the planned and the happenstance. I then came to Rowan in 2003 as an assistant professor in the psychology department. And I loved being a faculty member. I never had any plans to go into leadership. So what happened? Uh, looking back, some of the things I got involved in at Rowan during the early years might make it seem that I was preparing to enter the type of role I have now, but I really truly was not. I was active with our faculty center. I was the advising coordinator for the psychology department prior to uh, having professional advisors on campus. And these types of experiences introduced me to different leaders and others on campus, such that when there was an opportunity to get involved with more university-wide initiatives like our first year seminar program, I was invited to do that. And so that just began to snowball over a period of a couple of years. And truly the next thing I know is that I'm a full-time administrator and that was in 2012. On the personal front, I ended up actually with five wonderful children. I got two more. Uh, through uh, marriage 12 years ago. And I am just thrilled to be able to have that wonderful family as well as a career that I'm very passionate about. So now I'm in my ninth year as a full-time administrator at Rowan, a position that I never even intended to enter. Why do I stay when I love teaching so much? When I was a faculty member, I had the ability to impact probably about 100 students a semester, those directly involved in my courses. It, as an administrator, through my small role, I can have a, at least a little bit of impact on, on most of our students. And that's a real opportunity to affect positive change. If I'm given a, a seat at the table where I can advocate for students, that's what I wanna do. And now being an administrator for a number of years, I also grew to understand how important my role is in supporting my team, my employees, the wonderful dedicated professionals, who give above and beyond every single day. If I have the ability to do something to serve them, then that's what I'm called to do as well. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's easy to go into a leadership role or to stay there. And that's because oftentimes we have internal barriers that we put for ourselves. We often tell ourselves no, right? Rather, we don't apply for something. We don't take a chance. And actually what we learned from my field, social psychology, is that we can take intentional steps to overcome these barriers. And one of those is to understand what causes them. Uh, the imposter phenomenon is something that Trish Urak and I did a, a considerable amount of research on here at Rowan. We published a couple papers. And the imposter phenomenon is when you believe secretly that you're actually incompetent and that you're about to be found out. So somehow I fooled everyone into giving me a leadership role, but any day now they're going to discover that I'm a fraud. And that's a scary feeling. 
What Trish and I found in our research is actually every single person we asked to describe a situation where they felt that way was able to do so. It's a universal experience, particularly when you're new in a role. And so when you feel that way, the important thing is to reject that feeling and instead to say, no, I am good enough, I'm smart enough, and I can do this. Another uh, finding from social psychology has to do with regret. We all have things in our past that we regret. Some research has looked at, do we regret the times we tried to do something and failed more, or do we regret more those times when we didn't try to do something, where we, we had inaction instead of action? And what the research shows is that it's actually times of inaction that we regret more. That time that we thought about doing something but didn't do it, we regret more. And so that leads to my personal motto, which is get caught trying which is we all operate under times of uncertainty where we're not quite sure what the right action is. And, but to, to feel confident and to say, I think I know how to solve this problem, take that step. You might not be right all the time, you might get caught trying, but it's better than not taking action. In sum, I see leadership as an unanticipated opportunity to serve and support. And I need to share a couple of quotes. My team knows that I love to collect student feedback and many times our students will email regarding our staff members and all of the help that they've given. We're able to create those planned happenstance moments for students by helping them to get their foot in the door with those first opportunities. So I wanna share a couple of those quotes. These are again about some of my team members. You always give me hope that I can succeed despite my circumstances or disabilities. There have been plenty of times where I wanted to give up, but when I see your smile, it gives me hope. I always tell others about the career service office. I hope to be one of those success stories you can boast about for years. Another quote about one of our team members. I wanna thank you for your help throughout my time at Rowan. I've been through heaven and hell and back trying to chase my degrees. Thank you for doing such a wonderful job and guiding me through this process. The light is no longer at the end of the tunnel for me. I now stand in the light of a new dawn. I now can achieve the dream of being a teacher and showing others the way to enlightenment. You have played a role in their path to success as well. So I wanna say thank you so much. If I have the opportunity to, to uh, from my seat at the table, contribute to that amazing work that's happening, Social uh, student success work at a university is extremely powerful for creating opportunities for students and done right, it can even be social justice work. And so I greatly appreciate these years of opportunity. I greatly appreciate everyone in the Rowan community and what they have risen to do during, especially during this most difficult year. And I hope that everyone will um, continue to, to pursue those things that matter to you, to get caught trying, to serve, and uh, thank you again, take care, give grace and be well. Thank you, Rory, so much. What a, another amazing story of inspiration. I love how you say like the idea of things falling into your lap, right? The happenstance that certainly happened for, for me throughout my career. And, and I found personally that I'm very grateful for those chance events because they've changed my life. Um, so it's really great to hear somebody with a similar story. Um, I just want to, before we move on to our next speaker, I want to remind all of our attendees today, if you have questions for our panelists, please send them into the Q&A and we'll field them at the end of the event, okay? Don't be shy. Take that risk. Um, ask Now is your opportunity to ask some really challenging questions for our group. Um, so next, I'm going to introduce Penny McPherson Myers. Penny? Thank you so very much, Chrissy, um, and the members of the Women Alliance Network for having me. Uh, when Denise asked me or uh, invited me to speak at this event, I hesitated. Um, I don't quite enjoy publicly speaking, but uh, one thing that is constant through my story is that I constantly push myself beyond my comfort zone um, and accept challenges while privately kicking and screaming. Um, recently in our department, we had an exercise, um, the mask that you wear, uh, where I had to describe on one side how people see me, um, what people know about me, what people may believe about me, and on the other side, um, I had to describe how I see myself, um, what I know to be true and who I believe I am and can be. Um, so I believe people see me as having it all figured out. Um, but as I share my story, you'll see that I don't and never did. Um, I just follow my passion. 
Um, I'm intentional and thoughtful in my words and my actions, uh, and I work hard to do the best that I can. So excuse my voice, I'm a little under the weather. Um, so I think it's important for me to start uh, with a little bit about who I am and how I came to be. I grew up in Willingboro, New Jersey, uh, youngest of four. Uh, I didn't have any plans to attend college, a first generation college student. Um, my working class parents didn't really mention college to me um, as I was growing up. Um, being a good person, uh, being a kind human, honest, uh, having integrity, a strong work ethic, that was more of the message I received from home. Uh, my school counselors didn't do much to encourage me or motivate me to attend college as well. Um, they just guided me to non-college preparatory courses. So although um, I was active in clubs and sports, I wasn't a standout. Um, it was like I was given permission to fly under the radar, and that's pretty much what I did. Um, I hadn't set significant future plans for myself. Um, I was really, I guess, going with the flow. I recall in my Senior year um, of high school, my science teacher, uh, Mr. Nasif, asked uh, what my plans were after graduation. I told him I planned to go to work, um, as I had seen my parents do and uh, my siblings. And uh, he was surprised that I wasn't going to college and suggested that I uh, might be a good news reporter. I confirmed that I was not going to college. Um, and he said, OK, kind of shrugged it off and said, um, I'll see you serving Slurpees at 7-Eleven in a couple of years. Uh, that comment didn't affect me at that moment, but uh, immediately after I graduated and started to work in the mall, um, I could hear Mr. Nasif's words um, constantly in my head. Around that time, my older brother brought a college application home, um, and it was for an out-of-state school and said that he had connections if I wanted to go there. Um, at the moment, I started to consider college and began thinking about whether I wanted to go, um, but I knew I didn't want to go out of state. Um, and I started to think about local and some of the local community colleges and uh, colleges around the state. Um, not sure if I was going to go to college, but I started to worry that Mr. Nasib's words were going to come true. So with low SAT scores and average grades uh, from non-prep courses, uh, college prep courses, I began to reject uh, or receive rejection letters from the colleges that I applied. Um, and I started to, but as those rejection letters started to come in, um, I still had a hunger now to start to, to consider going to college. Um, and I started to see myself differently. Um, I began setting goals for myself and um, I could no longer be satisfied by just working at the mall. My life changed when I received a letter from uh, the then Glasgow State College, now Rowan University, uh, asking me to come in for an interview for the EOF MAP program, which is now the Ascend program. I remember being excited um, that I was not rejected, but not really grasping the concept of the opportunity being awarded to me. Uh, soon after the interview, I reviewed the acceptance letter um, and it informed me that I needed to attend a six week summer program to assist in developing my academic skills and prepare me for college. During that summer, I had the opportunity to meet new friends um, and staff who saw my potential, um, encouraged and supported me. Um, that experience was the beginning of me realizing my potential and uncovering a world of possibilities. So I'm thankful to Mr. Nasif uh, for being the first to see something more in me and uh, saying just the right words that kept nudging at me to be more. Um, and for the EOF MAP staff, students and other faculty and staff members around campus that continue to build me up. So um, a message to each of you, never underestimate the power of your words um, and take time to show people, especially our students, that you believe in them. So fast forward, I graduated with a degree um, in law and justice and spent three years working in a community-based program to provide support for juvenile offenders. Um, then I was a director for a residential treatment facility for adolescent female offenders in Delaware. And after working there for three years, the structure and philosophy of the program changed drastically. Um, where filling beds became more of a priority than providing adequate support and treatment um, and a safe residential space for our young people. So after advocating um, and really trying to fight for change, um, I realized that they were not going to change and I could no longer stay um, at that job because my values and ethics would be, excuse me, were being compromised. So I left. Um, ironically, I was hired by um, Burlington County College as an EOF counselor. So when I was hired as a counselor, I was asked uh, why I would accept a staff position um, when I had experience being an administrator. One message I would like to leave here is to never be afraid to start over. Um, I stated that although I've been an administrator, I had not been an administrator in higher education. Um, and in order to understand the importance of that role, I was uh, grateful to learn um, as a counselor. 
Um, however, I did trust my skills and was not worried about the level or the status of the position. But most of all, I was excited because I knew I was going to love the job. Uh, in addition to doing my job, I was a sponge, learning everything I could about the grant requir requirements, observing my um, supervisor in her role, joining committees, and getting familiar with all aspects of student services outside of my role. Within a year or so, um, I became the director of that um, EOF program. Um, and with that, became it, it came with the requirement that I get a master's degree, which I did here at Rowan I'm in the stu with student personnel uh, services. Uh, I was the EOF director at Burlington County College for about seven years when I inquired about opportunities for advancement. Uh, and I was informed that it was a flat administration and there were no plans for restructuring at that time. So um, instead of, you know, just accepting that and, and being okay, um, I sought to find ways to grow professionally and personally. So I applied to Rowan's uh, educational leadership program. Uh, many people have asked me, um, you know, what was my motivation for getting my doctorate? And there were a couple of things in addition to, again, wanting to personally grow. Um, the statewide EOF community that, that I was a part of at the time was very instrumental in encouraging all staff to expand their education um, and pointed out the lack of uh, people of color with advanced degrees. I also met people with their doctorate and realized that if they could do it, I definitely can do it. Um, but more importantly, as a first generation director of a program for underserved minoritized students, uh, what a better way to show others um, who are just like me that an ordinary person with similar background can achieve such, height, such heights. Uh, I was also motivated to be an example for my children um, and to be the first in my family to have accomplished this goal. And I also never wanted a position to be out of my reach due to the lack of a degree when I knew I was capable. Um, in the EDD program, I learned about my own leadership and how uh, far I can push myself. I'm um, also proud that through that experience, I was able to develop a learning community for the Ascend students that is still active today. Many times um, I feel like I don't have much left to give or I can be exhausted from the, the work that we have to do um, or I'm not quite sure how to get something done. But I realized I felt that before those feelings. Um, I recall many nights um, looking at comments from my dissertation committee for hours, not knowing what to do, um, but just sitting there and trusting my ability. I figured it out and have overcome those feelings um, and got it done. Around the same time that I um, enrolled in the EDD program, I was hired at Rowan as the director of the EOF MAP program. Again, full circle, I'm back where I started. Um, I'm thankful for all the experiences that I had through the many roles that I held, um, all of which fed my passion, working with students and staff in the Ascend program, assisting with the development of the Shop Food Pantry and the First Generation Task Force, and being an integral member of the dynamic division of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office, which continuously challenges the status quo um, and has created groundbreaking, groundbreaking innovative work since its inception. I'm also thankful to the leaders um, that have continued, um, that have and continue to challenge me, whether they know it or not. Um, many times I'm asked to do things and will give, will give an enthusiastic yes uh, to task, having no idea where to start. Um, but it is the belief um, that the others have in me and the evidence of things that I have accomplished that I recall on to tell myself that I can do it. Uh, over the years, I have grown in my leadership uh, from experiences that, I've, that have challenged me as well, where I didn't feel seen or valued. Um, maybe I have questioned my ability and my work um, or my, work, my worth at work. Um, I've taken those moments to reflect on my inner strength and found that those were the times when I have done some amazing things. So my message to, do, to you with that is to believe in yourself, your ability and your worth. Again, sorry, I'm gonna take a drink. So in closing, sorry, um, I believe that passion has been the common thread of my leadership success. Just as I did not have a plan for my future when I was in high school, um, I never or even imagined I would be, be uh, a vice president here at Rowan University, but um, believe that this is exactly where I'm destined to be. Uh, the, other, uh, the other side of my mask shows that I attribute to my leadership progression, uh, my ability to successfully adapt to change, uh, being intentional in my work and my words, uh, leading with authenticity, um, understanding that I am not an expert, but I do my best at all times, seeing and believing in my colleagues, staff, and students, um, genuinely caring beyond my job, um, and my willingness to stretch myself, to learn new skills, learn from mistakes, and realize my potential. Um, and on a final note, uh, I want to give a shout out to Shonda Rhimes for her book, The Year of Yes, 
that has helped me to say yes, which has created opportunities that I would never have had if I said no. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Penny. I, I, what I really loved in your, your presentation was how you talked about those people who have been in your life, who've helped to show you that you are the amazing, capable person that you are, right? I think for all of us that, that idea of mentorship and partnership with leaders is something that we need and, and, and something that our group really strives to do, right? To provide that, that window, that opportunity. And also what you said, that challenge, right? That challenge to ourselves to believe in ourselves, to know that we have it, and to let it shine. I think that's really, really crucial for everyone, um, especially if they're thinking or questioning leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Leadership is a challenge. Yes, it's it not is. easy. Um, but I think it's important to think about how can we allow ourselves the, the grace and the room mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. take that challenge. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate what you said today. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, okay, so next I'm going to turn it over to Roxy Patton. Roxy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today and to share a little bit about my journey in coming to know myself as a leader and some of the barriers that many of us come up against. So for anyone who's had a second of time with me, you know that I came into my journey with higher education through the creative arts. So I thought what better way to start my talk than with a spoken word piece. I am they, a grammatical error or a gender conundrum. You balance on the edge of the box you try to put me in. I do not fit. But there are multitudes of she, he, they, tearing at the walls of the boxes and demanding a life free of barriers, demanding to be seen beyond pink and blue, dresses and pants, facial hair and makeup, to be seen for who I am. They, for they contains multitudes, galaxies, depth and breadth, not he, not she, but they, they, them, theirs, singular and yet expansive in my multiplicity. They who live a life of abundance. They who are not defined by constructs of gender which do not suit them. They, they, God, it feels so good to say it out loud, to feel liberated in my identity, not despite of it. To be me, unapologetically, so please don't ask me why my pronouns matter. My pronouns are identity. They are respect. They are joy. They are meaning. Don't ask my preference. Ask me who I am. Ask what pronouns I use and then join in the fun. Jump in. Tell me yours. I am they, them, theirs. Now stop teetering on the edge of your box and jump into the expanse. Tell me about you. So being a gender non-conforming queer disabled person hasn't always made my life easy. I have performed woman incorrectly in every way you could possibly imagine. I have been visible, loud, fat, butch, soft, emotional, too much and not enough somehow in the same breath. And I think that's very relatable for a lot of us. Um, there were a lot of judgments made by others and perceptions of my gender without my input or my consent. As a graduate student um, in studying student affairs in higher education, I became homeless unexpectedly, which as you can imagine, wasn't fantastic for my health and well-being, but it wasn't actually the first time I had experienced homelessness. I grew up poor in rural Appalachia, so it was a regular part of my experience to um, be homeless or to not have electric or to have financial issues or barriers, but it was the first time I experienced homelessness after being diagnosed with a chronic illness. And the stress of that um, wrecked my autoimmune system and landed me in the hospital for a week, which made me miss a whole week of my graduate internship um, at a university that I was visiting. When I returned, my supervisor pulled me in to have a conversation and she said that while I was in the hospital, she did some research about my chronic illness and found that staff can be, or that stress can be a trigger um, for my, my health condition and said, you know, the field of student affairs is actually really stressful. And I don't know if this is gonna be a good fit for a disabled person. You might wanna consider your options and take a look at other careers that might be more suited for someone who has your, your health concerns. 
this was the first time in my professional career that I navigated being seen as incorrect or unallowed to show up as who I really was. And it began to shape the way that I thought about myself um, in professional spaces and who I was as a person and how much of that I was actually gonna be able to bring with me into the workspace. During my first year as a full-time professional, I was running an LGBTQIA plus center. Um, and my supervisor at the time ran a gender and inclusion center. And I was really surprised one day when she called me into her office and she said she had some concerns about my professional attire. And I thought I was dressing professionally. I had showed up every day with blazers or blouses and slacks. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, as a first generation student, there must be something I missed. Let me hear her out and what her concerns are. So she looked at me and she said, Roxy, you have a lot of personality, but I don't know that you need to wear it all to work every day. My heart sank in my chest. I remember that pit feeling in my stomach um, of, oh no, I've done it again. I've shown up incorrectly. And she said, you know, you just, it's too much makeup. And you can see today, I have not learned that lesson. <laughs> my makeup is an act of rebellion in a world that tells me I am too much. Uh, she said, it's too much makeup, too much color, too much patterns. Why do you need all those bracelets? Tone it down was her advice. Show up in black and beige and navy. No one will take you seriously looking the way you look. I had done it again. Here I was, incorrect, and trying to figure out how I could show up. And I think the most discouraging part for me was that I was doing diversity work. Isn't that the place where, if anywhere, I could show up as I was um, and figure out my voice as a new leader? Wouldn't I be seen here? A few years later, I began supervising graduate students and professional students. And I dealt with the challenges that I think all of us who supervise students face, they have lives outside of the office. And one of the students that I oversaw had a situation that had come up where they had a really rough breakup with a partner they had been living with for several years and had to move out on their own and they were really struggling. The problem was this also meant they were struggling at work and as a new leader, I was going, trying to figure out how to hold space for her and help her heal while also still trying to hold her accountable for the work. And I reached out to a colleague who had been supervising longer than I had, hoping for some sort of magical wisdom and guidance about how I could hold the parts of myself that were true, this caring, vulnerable piece of myself, um, while also trying to help her get her, her job accomplished. And I was kind of shocked that their first thing that came out of their mouth is, well, Roxy, if you're going to be a leader, you need to grow a pair. I stopped dead in my tracks. What on earth did that mean? And they said, this is a workplace. This isn't a place where you show up with all your feelings. That's, that's wasting time. That's not productive. You need to grow a pair and be assertive and just tell her, you need to get the job done. And I stopped and I thought, oh goodness, here we are again, showing up incorrect with all my feelings and all my too muchness. And it was getting more and more difficult to live with this. I started recognizing that I was altering myself constantly um, for the people around me, disappearing myself. I would come home at the end of each day completely emotionally drained from the labor of adjusting to everyone's comfort but my own. And perhaps this is the most authentically woman part of my experience, that constant push by society for me to adjust myself for others, to disappear myself. A few years ago, the exhaustion and frustration finally came to an end. It got to me in a way that I did not expect, and I started to feel like I wasn't even sure I wanted to continue this work. I had been advocating for students my entire career. I'd been working to create spaces where they felt welcome to show up authentically and thrive. Um, but I never thought to do that for myself, to advocate for those spaces for me to show up. I had tried to fit this mold of a cisgender straight woman because. That's the only idea of a role model of professionalism that I had for myself. Um, I felt like that was the only option. So I started peeling back my beliefs about myself and my ideas around who could be professional. I started giving myself permission to show up more authentically with my students and with my colleagues. And most, most importantly, I stopped asking forgiveness for taking up space in meetings or for advocating for my needs. This meant pushing through a lot of fear and anxiety and fighting against barriers that have long been established um, and beginning a practice of radical vulnerability where I allowed myself to be seen fully. 
Um, so I put on that button up and tie that I wanted to wear and I, I cut my hair, shaved the sides with reckless abandon. I even got that nose ring I had been dreaming of my entire life, but I thought would never allow me to work in a professional space. Um, and the most beautiful thing about this was not just that I was happier. I mean, that's definitely a perk, but that my students saw my freedom as a sign that they could be more free and fully authentic with me. And I had never expected my own journey to inspire other folks to show up the way that they wanted to show up. It really had been about finding spaces to be authentic, but I started to create these really meaningful, powerful relationships with the students that I worked with and the folks that I supervised. So that battle did not come without scars. It was a lot of work and I think we all have a lot of work to do. So what I, I started to, to do is when I, started hearing myself picking up the ways that other people were putting me in boxes when i started feeling the pushback to saying maybe i'm not you don't have to see me this way it's okay if i talk a little bit more it's okay if i want to be more assertive some days or if i want to create a community of care on others um, because i started to learn that that baggage was not mine to unpack other people's perceptions of my gender and how i show up weren't mine to unpack, they were theirs, or maybe they're ours collectively as institutions of higher learning, but I knew they weren't mine because they no longer matched my fabulous outfits. Um, so I think maybe the most important thing that I learned throughout this process was that vulnerability and grace weren't actually incorrect woman the way I had been taught. They weren't incorrect professional. They weren't the incorrect way to show up. In fact, they were necessary parts of the human experience. I learned to be kinder to myself and to forgive myself for all the times I tried to disappear myself or wish myself away for others, pe other people's comfort and to forgive them for asking me to because these systems that we have been taught, um, we have all been up against them more than once. So as I close out my, my talk here today, I would pose a few questions to you if you're navigating the world and trying to figure out who you are as a leader and how you can step into your authenticity. So who are you truly and fundamentally deep down? In what ways have you been told you are incorrect or the ways that you show up are not correct? What are the boxes people have placed you in? And how can we begin to tear those down together? All right. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today, and I'm looking forward to our Q&A. Roxy, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad I had my camera off during that because honestly, your presentation brought me to tears. It's just so, it's so inspiring to hear you be so honest and so brave and to, to sh show that for others and to allow us all the space for ourselves. I think that's so important for people. And I just thank you for, for sharing that with us today. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna just move on to our last speaker and then we're gonna get to some amazing, oh, sorry, we have two more speakers. So our next speaker, um, Dr. Annette Riboli. Um, Annette, I'm gonna transfer it to you. Great, well, well, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm truly honored to be here with all of you and to be a co-panelist with such an amazing, accomplished uh, group of university leaders. Uh, no um, discussion at this time would be complete without saying that 2020 has been a year that has demanded resilience, grit, adaptability, emotional intelligence, innovation, and collaboration to address the challenges of a world that drastically changed overnight. And we're currently in a period of uncertainty. Now, we've seen that there's no single path that leaders take, uh, but we do have some commonalities. I'm going to speak about my own path and integrate my advice from my perspective, that is, to those of you uh, who uh, are aspiring leaders or uh, evolving your leadership style. Most of my values and beliefs were initially shaped during my childhood by my parents and extended family. I was an only child. My parents were in their late 30s when I was born. They were high school graduates, the children of immigrants. I grew up in a multi-generational household. My maternal grandmother took care of me in the first five years of my life while my mother worked outside our home. And really, my first language was not English. That was an obstacle I had to overcome when I entered school, and I was always a bit 
uh, shy or embarrassed about it. My father was hardworking. He worked three jobs to put me through college and medical school. My mother was smart and entrepreneurial. She was the one who encouraged me to excel in academics. She wanted me to have the opportunities that she was denied at the time because of her gender and ethnicity. She encouraged me, as she used to say, to reach for the stars. Both of my parents had very strong work ethic um, that I believe that they instilled in me. They encouraged me to believe that I could do anything that I put my mind to and fostered that concept that I, and I alone controlled my own destiny. And this is something that I've communicated uh, to our students, uh, junior faculty, that you got this. Uh, you control where you go in life. I've always had a very competitive spirit and always wanted to do my very best at whatever task uh, was put before me. I attended an all girls regional Catholic high school during the second wave of feminism. And I truly believe that that was foundational and reaffirmed that women could do anything. Uh, the teachers were by and large sisters of charity and they fostered this also and, and buoyed this concept. I then went to Georgetown University for college, medical school, residency and in internal medicine. And my first leadership position uh, was as chief medical resident. I didn't realize it at the time, but Georgetown was and is at the foremost, uh, at the forefront, I would say, of social justice. My time there shaped my philosophy of servant leadership in the tradition of Greenleaf, and also the concept in medical school that was put forth of cura personalis, care of the whole person, not just. Uh, viewing your patient as a disease entity. I then went on to complete a three-year clinical and research fellowship in infectious diseases at the Medical University of South Carolina. So how did this Northeastern girl wind up in South Carolina? Well, it's a long story, but it came down to two programs. I was married and my husband was a physician in the Air Force, and it was either Charleston, South Carolina, or Greenville, uh, or um, uh, Green uh, Greenberg, uh, as well in in Florida. So uh, it, it was it was during this time though that I discovered my passion for research on candidemia and invasive candidiasis. So places that you go where you may not otherwise think you would go uh, do lead to great things. So advice piece of advice number one: seize the opportunity. These turbulent and uncertain times do create opportunities, and that's what we look for. Those who step up to lead uh, during uh, these times often make the greatest difference, uh, especially in a fast changing and uncertain environment. I was asked to become ID division head during a serious financial crisis in the late 1990s. Uh, that was my, uh, actually my first uh, real uh, leadership position. When I was offered the position, the departmental chair at the time said he wanted a passionate dance partner. And I remember at first thinking, I wonder what he means about this. I, I really wonder what he means. Um, and uh, you know, I reflected on it that evening and I thought, I wonder what he means by this expression, passionate dance partner. He wanted someone who was not just taking the job in a willy nilly fashion, but somebody who was gonna really uh, put their heart and soul in it. Uh, and I advise you to do that. So seize the opportunity, but when the opportunity presents itself, the aspiring leader must be ready and must really be committed to do it. They have to be passionate about it. These jobs are hard work. If you take them and you really don't want them, it doesn't work out. You might have to take risks, okay, to do so. And risk taking requires courage. Uh, remember, people frequently say uh, you have to go out on a limb to get the best fruit. So, so keep that in mind. Um, I'll also at this point add my story about becoming acti acting dean. So at that point, I was solidly moving along in my career. I was already a deputy chief in the Department of Medicine. It was the summer of 2009. And I had just, I was just coming out of a period where 
uh, my mother had passed away after a, a long and tough illness. She was living with my husband and I, and uh, during the day we had AIDS with her, and in the evening we did all the care. So I was driving in one summer morning and I got a call from my then boss, the chair of medicine, and he said, the CEO, Mr. John Sheridan, wants to see you in his office this morning. I said, could you tell me what's going on? He said, no, just go there. So I, I instantly thought, I wonder what happened. I wonder if somebody, one of my faculty or one of my fellows did something egregious in the clinical environment. Uh, but I went to meet with him. And he, you know, he welcomed me warmly and he said, sit down. He said, I want you uh, to think about uh, serving as uh, the acting dean for the new medical school. Uh, someone else was supposed to do it, but uh, they had a serious illness and could not go forward and do this. So he talked to me, he asked me about, you know, what I would do in different circumstances. It was like a behavioral interview. And then he handed me literally a stack like this of papers. And he said, read these, summarize, and tell me what you think we should do to jumpstart this medical school. And it was Friday after Friday by that time. They said, let's meet together on Monday morning at seven o'clock and we're gonna go over this. So uh, in retrospect, so I did everything. I worked fiendishly that weekend. I researched things. I read all the documents and I put together a summary, which I sent him on Sunday night in preparation for our Monday morning. I think ultimately I got offered the position because I had a reputation for meeting deadlines and could organize people and build consensus. Advice number two, make your desires known. Tell your supervisor about your interests or aspirations. That's how I became deputy chief of the Department of Medicine. Recall, folks aren't mind readers. The new chief of the department was a colleague of mine. I was division head of ID. He was division head of cardiology. When he became chief, I met with him and told him about my interest in serving the department in a larger role than at the divisional level. He was surprised that I wanted to do this but we created a position for me and the rest became history. Uh, that's also how uh, I wound up becoming acting dean. He recommended me for that position. So I would advise that you volunteer for new projects or to work on a committee. Put yourself out there. If you're selected for something, though, give it your all. That will get you noticed in a positive way. Leaders tend to choose those that they they get to know and that they know can do the job. But if you fail to perform, it's unlikely that same person will give you another chance. Number three, a leader takes people where they wouldn't go on their own. I believe that that's the essence of leadership. The leader must have a vision for their organization and find ways to offer direction to others to realize that vision. They must personally exemplify the mission, values, and standards of an organization and reinforce the culture of the institution at every opportunity that they can. If leadership doesn't live the culture, nobody else will. Frequently, as a leader, you have to make difficult decisions for the good of the organization. It frequently takes courage and conviction to do so. It's relatively easy to be a leader in good times, but very difficult in hard times. And if you're so inclined to always want to be popular or much loved, leadership might be a hard road for you. Number four, you can't lead with your feet on the desk. I've often heard people say a leader knows the way, shows the way, and goes the way. That doesn't mean that you have to be a subject matter expert in everything. You can't be. Uh, but you have to know en enough about the different areas that you supervise. Uh, but you also have to entrust uh, to others. I've always been blessed. In fact, at the medical school here in Camden, I have a great team. And I depend on that team who are indeed the subject matter experts. But I do ask them questions, not to second guess them or to micromanage them, but be, be, to be sure that I have accountability to the leadership above me, our provost, our president, et cetera. 
John Le, Le Carre said, a desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. And I just, I don't think I have to make a comment on that. The second quote is from Ray Kroc. Uh, the quality of a leader is reflected in the standards they set for themselves. Most of us are very self-critical. So I say lead from the front and be willing to give yourself tough jobs. I've always been known to roll up my sleeves and I personally don't like it when someone I supervise isn't like-minded. A couple of years ago, I offered an opportunity to someone who had just gotten an advanced degree. And I thought they could advance and do a wonderful service for the school and our student body. I asked them for a proposal. They came back to me with a proposal to hire several people under them to start the project. Needless to say, that didn't impress me and wasn't very practical. So uh, this concept of you can't lead with your feet on the desk comes from Ed Fuller's book. Uh, it's about building relationships, breaking down barriers, getting out from behind your desk as ways to deliver success. My personal opinion is that personal relationships are the real bedrock of long-term success in any organization. And remember the success of the leader rests firmly on the, those who work with and for you. Fuller delivers advice on how to connect with manage and do business with people in really any culture, building trust, having shared values and commitment is harder in multicultural situations, but I believe it's crucial for success in today's environment. Modern leaders need to know how to manage and interact in a multicultural environment. Relationships become the currency of every culture. Relationships are built through mutual respect, and trust is earned by delivering on promises. Delivering is part of your own integrity. So I urge you to build your relationships in your office, in your department, in your college, and throughout the larger university. That will do you in good stead. N number five, leadership is a skill that must be developed and honed. So how do you develop your skill? First, establish yourself as highly capable in your field. That will gain you the respect of your colleagues. In my first faculty position, I strove to become the most knowledgeable ID faculty member that I could be, and ultimately to be the very best consultant that I could be. And to this day, I give advice to junior faculty along those lines. Although I'm not a juggler, I like to use a juggling analogy where you toss one ball in the air and get that going. And once that's going smoothly, then you add a second or a third ball and more and more balls as time goes on. Over time, I added teaching, committee service, research, and then ultimately leader, leadership positions. But I was careful never to take on too much at one time. Adding one ball at a time and not adding the next one until I was accomplished with the previous ones. There are a number of courses and compelling books about leadership that I feel are worth a read. Some have, some have uh, mentioned their favorite books. I would encourage you to read these books by authors both within your professional field, but also outside of it. And one of my favorite recent reads is Doris Kearns Goodwin, the Presidential Historian and Pulitzer Prize winner. She wrote a recent book called Leadership in Turbulent Times. In this book, she provides a roadmap for aspiring and established leaders in every field. And she applies her study and insights uh, with some really good storytelling to demonstrate how four exceptional US presidents, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, and Lyndon Johnson overcame adversity and tr transcended personal ambition to advance the lives of others. These are stories of authentic leadership leaders who were guided by moral purpose, who were collaborative, who had compromise, but very importantly showed great civility uh, to the opposing parties. With perseverance and hard work, they became leaders by enhancing and developing the qualities that they were given. So look for specific leadership development programs in your field. 
Uh, I was sponsored for a year long executive leadership at, Cor at Morton Business School several years ago. It was hard work to do the program and work full time, but it was very beneficial. Not only did I learn a lot, but importantly, I developed a network of colleagues from the program who I can call on to this day for advice when I need it. Crucial to developing yourself is mentorship and even seeking sponsorship. I like to say, hit your wagon to a star. So choose somebody, not somebody who's disgruntled or angry. Choose someone who's upbeat, who will guide you to the next place, who will, who will raise you up, not take you down. In my first leadership role as chief resident, I had the opportunity to study the habits of the very successful chair of medicine. And throughout my career, I've continued to do that and tried to assimilate the best characteristics of the institutional leaders that I've had the privilege of working with. I continue to do that to this, this day in the present to study our institutional leaders. As important as assimilating admirable characteristics, uh, it's also equally important to see what goes wrong and where leaders fail or mishandle a situation. And there's no embarrassment in that as long as the leader owns it and works to make it right. Generationally, uh, most of my mentors and sponsors have been men. Only one is a woman. But I'd like to say your leaders don't necessarily have to look like you or be exactly like you. They just have to be good people who want to advance you, that see the potential in you and want to help you along the road. Number six, scholars have studied the development of leaders and they've cited resilience, the ability to stay, sustain your goals or ambitions in the face of setbacks or frustrations. That's at the heart of your growth. More important than what happens to a developing leader is how they respond to a reversal, how they manage in various ways to put themselves back together, how these defining experiences maybe at first impede them, but then deepen and finally mold them. I've had my share of personal and professional disappointments, but I've never let them get me down. I usually try to solicit feedback and regroup or retool then I put the event in my rear view mirror and move on. I'll leave you with one last thought. While intelligence is often quoted as an attribute of leaders, it is far and away insufficient in and of itself to foster success. Indeed, it's more the EQ than the IQ. And the EQ has commonly stood for emotional intelligence, but it also indicates other E's, effectiveness, efficiency, economy, equanimity, and empathy that makes the difference between the leader who's just a fast flash of lightning, here today, gone tomorrow, or a long burning candle. So thank you. Thank you, Annette, so much. I, I, what another great inspiring message, right? I love the idea that you talked about, especially regarding mentorship. Again, I think this has been a common theme for all of us today, but this idea of, you know, um, being able to lift those up around us, but also being able to ask the question, right? Being able to ask those who we aspire to, to, to shadow them, to work with them, to, you know, to, to see what their lives are about. Um, for me, that's something that I did really early on in my career and it changed where I was going completely changed my whole direction. So I, I think that's a great takeaway for us. Um, okay, so last but certainly not least, we have Melissa Weecroft. Melissa. You are on mute, Melissa. I'm sorry. Is my no, you're fine. <laughs> is my content now shared? Yep. You are Beautiful. you are up and sharing. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, first, let me thank uh, you for inviting me to be part of this uh, presentation today and among a group of such accomplished uh, leaders in this organization. It's truly a privilege and a pleasure. So I greatly appreciate that opportunity. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, the difficult role of being uh, the last presenter. It is uh, in equal parts uh, the hardest role 
Uh, but in some ways, as I was thinking about uh, listening to the uh, presentations as we went through today, uh, it might be the easiest because I have the pleasure of picking up on some of the themes that the earlier presenters talked about and really uh, trying to weave them into my uh, presentation as well. So I appreciate that opportunity. Um, so let me begin a little bit about myself. Um, as other uh, presenters talked about today, um, I uh, also am an only child like Annette. Uh, I am the child of two parents who were extraordinarily young. And the picture on the left is my mother and father at their wedding at 19 and 21, a uh, high school graduate. And I also am a first generation college student. Uh, my mom uh, was sort of first generation. So my mother actually went to night school and uh, graduated college while I was in high school. And my dad uh, also went part time. He graduated on college the same day I graduated from college. Uh, our family, while not traditionally educated, was very focused on education. And it was so important to them to go back to school and get their education, despite what was a fairly early marriage. Uh, the picture above is my grandparents uh, with me as a baby. And I just bring it out because the plaid jackets in the 70s were obviously a recurring theme in my family. Uh, you can also see that I went to an all girls Catholic high school. I showed the nun for a very particular reason. I think as Annette man, it, uh, mentioned, the uh, fact that I went to an all girls high school clearly shaped my experience as a leader. Uh, in an all girls high school where there is no one else to assume roles of leadership, uh, we assumed every role from captains of sports teams to student government leader to NHS leader. And uh, that clearly uh, marked the way in which I went about leading in my future. Uh, you can also see uh, that my grandmother is pictured in uh, this heavily. And although my parents both worked um, and my mother worked from the day almost after I was born, she went back to work when I was four weeks old, uh, my grandmother uh, primarily raised me. And so I spent most of my time with my grandmother who was high school educated only, but uh, very focused on education and high academic performance. I remember her teaching me to read when I was four, teaching me cursive, a, a lost skill now when I was five. Uh, my grandmother was very focused on me learning. And uh, when I went to college, it was one of the proudest moments of her life. Um, after I went to college, uh, I went to law school and I went to uh, Rutgers Camden. And I would be remiss, although I wasn't going to tell this story, but Roxy mentioned uh, being painted in a box and expectations. And it's something I just wanted to share because it really hit home for me. Uh, in law school, we were in our one of our very first courses, which was an advocacy course, where you learn how to advocate and do a mock trial. And you have to do an you have to do a closing argument. And uh, I remember practicing for the closing argument and uh, the teacher of the class told me that I needed to go get a black suit because no one would take me seriously as a lawyer if I wasn't wearing a black suit. Uh, I went that weekend and I did indeed buy a, a lawyer suit, except I bought the one that was powder blue. And uh, I won that competition and came in first. And so I would just say, as Roxy mentioned, that we should be challenging expectations. While lawyers boxes are a little different than some of the boxes we're talking about in social justice, it was uh, you know, uh, unprecedented to wear a powder blue suit and do well in a competition. And we should be willing to take those risks every single day, because if we're not, uh, we won't stretch ourselves. So uh, on that point on stretching yourself, I would note that I think that we all need to acknowledge uh, Rory's point about planned happenstance and that the reality is that there's not really a right time to accept a new challenge. Uh, that right time is today. Uh, when I was a lawyer at a law firm in New Jersey, I built a very close relationship with the human resources professional at one of our clients. And that company was a uh, nonprofit residential and educational provider for individuals with developmental dis dis disabilities and cognitive impairments. And they were having major financial problems. They were considering bankruptcy. They were in program closure. They thought that they were going to have to find residential placements for 2,000 individuals. 
Um, it was at that point that they said to me that they were spending too much money on legal bills and they wanted me to take the job. They wanted me to be their first general counsel. They didn't have an established legal role. The company was failing financially. I had zero direct experience as a general counsel. I was a labor and employment lawyer. All I did was talk about handbooks and labor and employment litigation. Uh, and on top of that, I had very recently found out that I was pregnant with my second child. And on top of that, I was 31. It was the wrong time to accept this job. Uh, in fact, when I talked to my supervisors at my current job, uh, one of my supervisors said to me, Melissa, have you looked at the balance sheet? And are you serious about this? And I said, I was, and he respected that decision. Uh, I had a great support structure in place. That's my husband pictured in that picture. And uh, we talked about it. My backup plan at the time, because I was pregnant with child number two, was that if uh, the company did not do well, I would help them transition the individuals to new homes and be safe. And then I could take some time off and be a stay at home mom. So that was the backup plan. And because of the support structure I had in place with my family, I was able to look at that as an option. Uh, what was a turning point for me though, is I made the decision and I went into work to communicate my resignation decision, which was a very big professional moment. I had not previously resigned from a professional position and I had held that position for over eight years. And so this was a large move for me. I went to a different supervisor, not the one who had encouraged me to think about the decision, but to a supervisor who um, was a person I needed to tell the decision to. And he said to me, um, I want you to think a little bit more carefully about this. I want you to take it seriously. I'm not gonna take your decision. You go home, talk to your husband about it, make sure he's okay with it. Um, I did indeed go home and double down on my decision. The fact that a supervisor would have um, the audacity to tell me that I should make sure to talk to my husband before I made such a serious decision, frankly, just solidified why I needed to do this for myself. And I did it. I went to a nonprofit residential provider where I was surrounded with physicians and clinicians and social workers and psychologists, very different people than lawyers. They think differently. They speak differently. They interact differently. They process differently. The transition was not easy. I learned pretty quickly that I'm not always right. For those of you who work with me, you might not believe that I think that, but I know it. Um, and I learned it at this job. I learned that people, because they think differently and process differently or more slowly, it doesn't make their opinion any less valuable. Just because I can be the loudest person in the room doesn't mean that I have the right answer. And it's important to give people the time and space they need to come up with their right answer and work collaboratively towards the right outcome. So we have to respect their processes and learn from the information that they're providing to us. As Tabitha mentioned, lifelong learning is critical. And that lifelong learning isn't just about topics and concepts, it's about ourselves. So, um, what did I learn at this opportunity? I grew exponentially as a professional. I learned every legal area. I used to be labor and employment lawyer. I learned real estate. I learned corporate governance. I learned nonprofit law. I learned about fundraising. I also learned about professional setbacks. After about seven years in the legal role, I took the role as vice president of operations and was responsible for the operations of the entire organization, including the ultimate vice president for about 2000 employees. I served in that role for a year when uh, the CEO decided that she wanted to downsize the organization and eliminate an entire layer of leadership. Uh, on one day, she took out the chief operating officer, the chief medical officer, and the vice president of operations. That was me. I was downsized. I was living through what, as an employment lawyer, I had counseled other people about. And frankly, it was a turning point in my career. Uh, number one, it gave me an opportunity to, to figure out whether I wanted to continue to be a lawyer or be an executive. Uh, number two, it taught me a lot about how we should treat people in situations like a downsizing. Uh, she went right by the book, no notice, no opportunity, just come in and deliver the message. And what I think we've learned is that people should be treated with empathy and compassion and an opportunity to talk about 
how the change impacts them, and certainly how the change impacts the lives of individuals with developmental disabilities who were very used to seeing me as a part of their organization. Um, I quickly was offered a number of different roles after that, and uh, we're going to hear about the importance of relationships, that recurring theme in a second. Uh, I was offered traditional legal roles, I was offered a role in public policy, and I was offered a role in in-house uh, as associate general counsel. And we heard um, earlier about uh, not being afraid to start over from Penny, and that's a critical message. Uh, the associate general counsel position was a step down. I was general counsel at my prior job, but I took the role because I thought it would be a great opportunity to learn about higher education, which was something about which I did not know. Uh, I have valued lifelong learning here at Rowan, and one of the main reasons I came to an institution of higher education is because I think that every single day we need to continue to learn, and I live that. Um, and I'll just flag real quickly, the issue of constitutional law is a great example. Uh, con law was actually my worst grade in law school. I got a B. Um, it was pretty devastating to me, lowest grade I got. I did pretty well otherwise. Um, but what I have found is that something was that was theoretical to me. And part of the reason I got a B was I couldn't understand why this would ever matter in my real life. It matters every day. It matters every day in this university when we think about students' rights to assemble, students' rights to voice their free speech, individuals' rights to express their freedom of religion, and it matters in our society. When we think about every voice counting, we think about freedom of speech, and we should never forget to think about the importance of that issue. So quickly, back to relationships, and then I'll sum up because I know we only have about two more minutes left. Uh, relationships, Annette talked about the importance of relationships, and I would just say to you and echo that you need to do the work. It's important to maintain your professional networks and in your internal relationships. You cannot be successful in a professional role or leadership role if you do not build relationships with those of your colleagues and those who work for you and those you work for. Um, and I would say to you that it's those relationships that will be valuable to you when you're considering other opportunities. And so, as I mentioned, with the other job opportunities, after one opportunity went away, many other opportunities presented themselves because I had put the work in and maintained relationships. I had volunteered on committees. I had volunteered in women's professional networks and other networks. Make sure you do the same. It's essential for your continued professional growth. I also think, and I would be remiss if I didn't finalize my thoughts on this today, which I don't think anybody else said, so it's my one novel thought today, make sure you exercise every day. Uh, know who you are and who you aren't. Uh, learn who you can be. Uh, about a decade ago, if you had said to me that I would be a runner, I would have laughed out loud. I was an unathletic child. I never participated in, in sports. I hated to sweat. And about a decade ago, I started running and I haven't stopped. I run, I do yoga, and I run. And yes, I do it almost every day. And it doesn't have to be running, it doesn't have to be yoga. It can be baking, it can be meditating, but it should be something that makes you feel good. Because if you don't find that outlet, you won't be able to be fully successful in your work and in your family life. Those are some of the pictures of the things we baked during the pandemic. And part of the reason I'm running so much is because I also really like baked goods. Finally, I want to close with some gratuitous family pictures because it's hard not to end on a high note when you're showing your adorable children. That's my adorable child, Allison, and her brother, Ian. And you can see she's doing the eye roll, which she learned from her mom. That's our dog, Augie, who we love dearly. And that's my family picture. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to close. I hope that you all uh, learn something from today. I would say our goal needs to be that we learn something new every single day. And I certainly did from this group. So I thank you again for letting me be part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Again, another really interesting perspective, right, on how our personal journeys can lead us into leadership um, and how we can sort of take those opportunities and 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 move them move them for us and with us that's just so, so great to hear and as a fellow runner and yoga person and also chronic baker since march i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> so um i'm going to introduce uh, real quick denise dennery 
Denise is our fabulous, fantastic program and events committee chairperson, and, and she and her team have been behind the scenes putting together this event for you today. So first, I would be remiss um, if I did not thank her for her excellence and her work and her passion. Um, and I'm just gonna ask Denise to wrap us up with one quick Q&A for all of our presenters today. Denise? Thank you so much. Thank you to each of the presenters, the speakers today. We gained so much from your words, your experience. Thank you for sharing of yourselves with us today. Um, I wanted to remind the participants and the speakers that the recording of this event is available on the Rowan University WAN site. So you can always refer back to that um, for the recordings of the events. Could each of you just briefly remark on why did you choose leadership and what keeps you motivated? If you don't mind unmuting yourselves and if everybody could respond. This is um, Tabitha. I guess we can go in order of the order in which we spoke. And I would I I guess I've um sort of uh, had several people because I'm new to leadership ask me that question recently and I've had time to think and I think that the um the key here is that if you don't have a particular vision that you hope uh to to a, a direction you hope to go in there then you don't necessarily want to move into leadership but it, but if you have a particular vision if you have a particular thing that you see that will benefit the the institution that will benefit the entity that you're leading then then it's a good idea to to really try to um move in the direction of leadership and then move in the direction of uh implementing the vision that you have Uh, thanks. I would I would add that I think there's you know any opportunity to be contributing and if and from whatever seat that you're in, um, that's really what leadership is about. And uh, as I was saying, the the opportunity to serve I think is really key. Another reason why I stay in is because. And I really enjoy the challenges and the relationships that I've been able to build here. Um, again, uh, consistent with my um, with my I guess my talk, uh, I didn't choose leadership. I don't really know how I ended up here, um, but I do love working with people. I love problem solving. Um, I love strategizing. Um, and so I think that when you are good at what you do, it's recognized. Um, and I think that if everyone is working in their passion, that's recognized and that helps propel you into whatever leadership um realm you you end up in but so i just encourage you all to you know find your passion work hard at it um learn as much as you can and um and don't be afraid to to step outside of your comfort zone try new things um and be in places where you would normally be you'll you'll discover things that you would not have discovered if you didn't venture out So I thought we were going in order, but I'm happy to jump in if we're not. Uh, I go, go uh, ahead, Melissa. <laughs> all right. Um, I uh, would say that I chose leadership back to the point of uh, learning something new every day. It's the best way to learn something new every day about yourself and your colleagues, as well as uh, your subject matter area. I never have a day that I expected and never have a day where I don't walk away saying, wow, I didn't know that. Um, and what keeps me in it and what keeps me motivated, honestly, is uh, that same cycle of uh, constant motivation of wanting to learn something new and wanting to help uh, people um, be their best. And it's just honestly self-fulfilling, so. So I would say the ability to do something very impactful and very, very positive. So in my area, medicine, medical education, um, there's no greater way to influence the future of medicine than to be working with the students and uh, the faculty and the staff. And uh, 
uh, seeing the success of our students. So thank you. Thank you all again. Um, so that is going to wrap us up for today. I just want to again thank Denise, the programming committee. I want to thank all of our amazing presenters today for your um, your openness, your vulnerability, and providing us the opportunity to learn these little nuggets of joy from you. It was really great. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we shared the website for the Women's Alliance Network in the chat. Please check us out, join more events. If you are interested with working with us, um, with coming onto our board, with volunteering, we are open and we are here. So if you wanna learn more about how to, uh, how to get engaged, you can find our email address on our website or you can feel free to email me directly. Thank you everybody for being here. Take care, be well, have a great day.